Good evening. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for coming out tonight. This is a great crowd. And before beginning officially, I have a couple of quick announcements. First, following our lecture, we'll have some question and answer time, and, and we will be circulating the microphone for that. Um, second, the speaker will join us in the lobby for some light refreshments. And I also want, you, want to encourage you, especially if you're a student, um, to go out into the lobby and meet the other students who are tabling for climate change advocacy. They are students involved in the Catholic Relief Services Ambassador Program. And also you can find out more information about Care for Creation events on campus. Third, we're gonna be circulating a sign-in sheet. Um, if you are from the community and you want to be on our listserv, you can fill out your name and email. And if you are a student and want your professor to know that you were here, you should definitely fill out the information as well. <laughs> So thank you, and welcome again. My name is Arlene Montevecchio, and I am the director of the Center for Spirituality here at St. Mary's College. The Center for Spirituality was founded in 1984 with generous support and vision from the Sisters of the Holy Cross, some of whom are here tonight. I can see them, so thank you to them. And also, thank you to our founding director, Dr. Keith Egan, who's also Aquinas Chair Emeritus from St. Mary's College, who's here tonight as well. Thank you, Dr. Egan. Um, I am very pleased to introduce our distinguished guest, who will deliver the first in a series of three lectures on the theme, The Francis Effect, His Impact on Church and World. Tonight, I am pleased to welcome Father Daniel P. Horan, a Franciscan friar of Holy Name Province, New York, an assistant professor of systematic theology at the Catholic Theological Union in Chicago. Father Horan is the author of several books, including the award-winning The Franciscan Heart of Thomas Merton, a new look at, his, at the spiritual influence of his life, thought, and writing. His latest book is titled God is Not Fair and Other Reasons for Gratitude. And his next book, due out in spring of 2018, is titled, All God's Creatures, A Theology of Creation, which I think we'll get a sneak preview of tonight. His website, danharan.com, has more information about his writings, lectures, and retreats. He also has a Facebook page, and the Center for Spirituality has a Facebook page as well. So please like our pages. Father Haran received his bachelor's degree from St. Bonaventure University, where he now serves on the Board of Trustees his Master of Divinity and Master of Arts from Washington Theological Union, and his PhD in Theology from Boston College. Please join me in welcoming Father Horan to deliver Pope Francis and All God's Creatures, a challenge for the global church. That's very generous. Well, good evening, everybody. It's delightful to be with you. I'm, I'm honored to be a part of this lecture series here at St. Mary's, uh, really assessing and reflecting and considering together how Pope Francis has not only affected us, but what the God-willing, enduring effect of his ministry will be, uh, what it continues to be, and so forth. Um, but before I begin any of my remarks, I, I want to express, whoa, there I am. Can you hear me now? This in addition, whoa, here we go. Doug, are we good? All right. Um, apparently, in addition to uh, the Center for Spirituality and the Sisters of the Holy Cross, this lecture is being underwritten by Verizon with their old commercial, Can You Hear Me Now? Yeah, so. um, I want to express my gratitude to Arlene, uh, to Michelle, to all the folks at the Center for Spirituality, uh, to the sisters who uh, founded uh, this wonderful center uh, and continue to uh, you know, enrich the church, enrich the academy by the gift of the academic study of spirituality. Um, if I had more time, I would share with you uh, how significant uh, the work that began with Sister Madaleva here has been in my own formation as a theologian, as a friar, as a Christian. Um, we don't have time for that. I got I to talk about something else. So uh, to be continued for another point. Uh, and I had the great and, and distinguished ple pleasure of, of meeting and, and speaking with uh, Dr. Egan 
uh, over dinner this evening, and so I'm grateful for his service and vision in helping to implement uh, the intentions and the will of, of the sisters and, and this great gift to both the school, the academy, and the church at large. So uh, it's a joy to be with you. So I'm here to speak with you about uh, care for creation, creation in general, and hopefully not trip on these cords in the process. Um, and to do so with an eye toward Pope Francis, his legacy, his insight. Um, I've titled this talk, uh, at least subtitled it, A Challenge for the Global Church, and I mean that in two ways. So let me give you a little overview of the short time we'll have together. Can everybody see that all right? Okay, up here it's a little hard for me to see, but that's okay. I want to talk first and very briefly about our current context. Quoting Gaudium et Spes, you know, we're entrusted with the duty, the responsibility, the ministry of interpreting the signs of our times in the light of the gospel. And so let's just pause for a moment to take a look at our, what we might call, ecological signs. Then, just because I know in South Bend, this is a very astute audience, very sharp crowd of St. Mary's faculty and students, Notre Dame alums and, and, and faculty and so forth, you've all read the Dato C many, many, many times. I know that if Arlene were to distribute a quiz right now, it would be A's across the board. But for those who are afraid to take the quiz, we're just gonna do a quick review of what Laudato C says. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, we'll take a brief look at that, because I think it's important for us to remind ourselves uh, not just to look at the, pun intended, the trees of the forest of Laudato C, but to step back and look at the whole forest. Um, so we'll take a quick look at that. And here's what I mean by challenge, a challenge for the global church. On the one hand, I'd like to explore with you briefly tonight the challenge Pope Francis presents to the church. I think his encyclical letter and uh, his ongoing catechesis, his homilies, the other uh, informal talks that he's given, provides us with a challenge, many challenges in fact. And some of the other speakers, Professor Kavanaugh, Professor Wood, who will be here in, in the coming months, they will talk about other challenges as well that Pope Francis's ministry and legacy presents to the church. We're going to look through the lens of ecology and creation. But here's the other side of the challenge coin. I think Pope Francis leaves a challenge for us. A lot of attention has been paid to the ways in which Pope Francis's ministry, his insight, the Dato C in particular, presents us with a challenge, but not as much consideration has been given to what it hasn't done and what remains for us to do. And so I would hope that with you this evening, we can reflect on some of those trajectories. And I'll say more about that in a little bit. And then with what time we have left before they cut the power and pull the mic, we'll have some discussion and Q&A. Does that sound good? It doesn't matter, we're gonna do it anyways. <laughs> So the signs of our times. That's a view of two weeks ago uh, from a satellite of Hurricane Harvey heading into the Gulf Coast of Mexico, the Gulf of Mexico, rather, on the coast of, uh, of the eastern coast of Texas and, and to the western coast of Louisiana. Many of the images we saw in what followed are familiar to us now. It's important for us, as painful as some of these images may be, too, to keep in mind who was most directly affected or who was most significantly affected by this devastating storm. In addition to the uh, increasing ferocity, prevalence, strength of hurricanes that we're experiencing, in the United States, if we just look at our, our local uh, context a little bit, our national context. There are other ways in which climate change is affecting us right now that is a, a sign of our time, including wildfires that exist in the uh, western part of the United States, in the northwest in particular. We see in Washington state um, and elsewhere. Uh, we see our neighbors to the north in Canada, in Alberta, and some other places, some devastating wildfires. This photo was taken in September of 2017, just a few uh, weeks ago. If we expand our horizon just a little bit and look beyond the U.S. context, we begin to see other places where climate change is noticeable, where it's dramatic, 
where it affects the lives of tens of thousands and millions. We recall, this was uh, just a few years ago, we can go back a little bit earlier to the tsunami in Japan in 2011. Um, I'm afraid some of the slide is cut off, but you get the idea. The key thing, the reason why I'd like to begin this way is because we're in the midst of this reality. This isn't a far-fetched or hypothetical context. Uh, some have said, and we've seen it reported in the last two weeks, especially in the wake of hur hurricanes Harvey and Irma, and now we have a few more coming up uh, from the Caribbean, you'll hear people say things like, this is not the time to talk about global climate change. That's a direct quote from the current uh, director of the Environmental Protection Agency of all places. Uh, you'll see very few reports on uh, the des devastating effects that our impact on our environment has, not in the creation of these phenomena as such. It's true, hurricanes will happen and they happen every September and August and October. They will come. But they don't come as heavily, as strong, as forcefully as what we're experiencing now. Wildfires are a part of a natural cycle of forest life but not at the rates that we experience it. Droughts are common, but not this common. Species do become extinct, but not at the rate that we experience it today. Well, pollution, well, about 500 years ago or so, there wasn't a whole lot of human-made, widespread pollution of waterways and lands, was there? I don't know how people explain that one away. But these are the signs of our times. In fact, Pope Francis said on Sunday, coming back from Colombia about the signs of our times that you see the effects of climate change and scientists have clearly said what path we have to follow. Shout out to our biologists and other scientists present tonight. All of us have a responsibility, the Holy Father says. All of us, small or large, we have a moral responsibility. Each person has their own. Even politicians have their own. <clears throat> He, go, he went on to say that if someone is doubtful that this is true, that global climate change is not real, that this is a hoax or a myth perpetuated by whomever or what nation state, Pope Francis makes it clear. He gives a little bit of a, a, a tutor moment here. You know, go and ask the scientists. They should ask scientists. They are very clear. These are not opinions made on the fly. If there's one thing that Pope Francis is good at, it's speaking off the cuff. So with that in mind, aware of the situation in which we find ourselves today, an undeniable effect that we can witness, you know, sadly, we are seeing it right now, right, as uh, the city of Atlanta, for the first time in history, has had a tropical storm warning, a completely landlocked metropolitan area. This is not a normal thing, my friends. It's important for us to keep this context in mind as we look at uh, Pope Francis's encyclical letter. Just our refresher course. What is in this document? You could put it all on one slide. Did you know that? I think the structure is very significant for us to note. It's really important to look at how he and his advisors organized this uh, teaching. First of all, he opens in that introduction, in addition to the fact that he begins by uh, quoting the guy who made my outfit very fashionable 800 years ago, <laughs> Francis of Assisi. Um, he situates his, he situates this teaching within uh, the broader history of Catholic social teaching, and you may recall this. In addition to that, he draws from the tradition established by John the 23rd, now Saint Pope John the 23rd, uh, in his encyclical letter, Pachem and Terrace, in which he went beyond addressing just Christians or Catholics, but all people of goodwill. That may ring a bell for some of you. Pope Francis sort of sees John the 23rd and raises him, he says, I'm not addressing just people of goodwill. I don't care if you're of goodwill or ill will. I'm addressing all people who share what he says is our common home. That's important. This is, uh, in some sense, unprecedented. People were concerned uh, at the word that this document was coming out back in uh, the summer of 2015, and they said, well, what on earth is the, the Holy Father going to say? You know, how is he going to address this? What does this mean? And one of the key developments here uh, is, is not that he's highlighting the significance of uh, env environmental crises or the moral obligation that Christians have to respond uh, in light of that. 
one of the things that he does that's unique is address all people, all people who share a common home. What he does is follows, again, John the 23rd's pattern of see, act, or, uh, see judge, act, right? And if we look at that uh, trifold sort of uh, format or layout, we can see uh, pairs of two. He begins in chapter one by asking the question, what is happening? Looking at the world around us. Here he draws on the wisdom of climate scientists and other uh, scientists. I think this is on. Let me turn that off. Is that better? Where did Doug go? Okay, he's up there. I think I keep hitting this thing. My apologies, folks. Now, we, oh, can you hear me now? Oh, no, back, down. Okay. So he draws on the latest science. He's very explicit about the current state of the environment and makes the point that there, this is in no way up for debate. It's something he reiterated on Sunday on the flight back from Columbia, and we can't avoid the, tr the hard truth that he's addressing uh, those of us in the United States first and foremost. Uh, it seems to be a, a phenomenon located here that this is uh, something up for any kind of question or debate, but he's again invoking that first act that first practice of seeing, looking at the situation around us, then he looks not just at the situation of uh, the environment, of the crises that we face, but he looks at the, the Christian theological tradition, what he calls the gospel of creation. And he says, what resources do we have within our Christian tradition? Going to scripture, he corrects a misunderstanding, and I'll say more about that in a little bit, about how we are to read the Genesis accounts of creation, he talks about what a proper form of exegesis is for understanding humanity's place within that broader family and revisits the whole theological tradition, elevates, as it were, the gospel of creation uh, as one resource. If we move to that judgment area in the see, judge, act criteria, he moves then in chapter 3 to talk about the human rights of this ecological crisis that we experience today. In not, he names three kind of themes that are interwoven, interconnected, the first of which is anthropocentrism, placing ourselves at the center of creation. I think it's so interesting. Anthropocentrism is, is one of several systemic or, uh, you know, kind of structural injustices in our world that we're very uncomfortable addressing. We don't think about it that much, and that in and of itself is a sign that it's a problem. Uh, I'll say more about that in a little bit. But what he's talking about here is, as I like to say, though many people have accepted that we live in a heliocentric solar system, you know what that means, right? We don't believe that the sun revolves around the earth, or do we? I don't know. Is the jury out on that? Okay. <laughs> Nevertheless, we still seem to believe that all of creation, the whole cosmos, the whole universe revolves around the human species. Everything we believe by our daily actions as a species, as a community of human beings seems to reflect our self-centeredness, at least on a corporate level. That's a problem. And Pope Francis invites us to challenge that. Another thing he highlights, and this is a theme of his that's very commonplace, is the problem of indifference. Sure, many of us aren't going out there and burning lots of coal or driving our Humvees or leaving them running. I hope no one's leaving their Humvee running in the parking lot while they're attending this presentation tonight. Many of us are not going to the river and pouring oil or other kinds of toxins into waterways. That's just not our day-to-day -day experience. Maybe we even do really good things like, I don't know, recycle. Who doesn't love to recycle, right? these little things, and we say, you know what, we're doing the right thing, we're not doing any harm. Pope Francis invites us to consider that prayer that is uh, prayed at the beginning of every Eucharistic liturgy when Catholic Christians gather, the, the confidior, right, in which we ask for forgiveness for what we have done, and that's it, right? Some people are like, I don't know. <laughs> Where are the chaplains? Where is your campus? No, I'm just kidding. We pray for what we have done. We ask for forgiveness before the Lord for what we have done and for what we have failed to do, right? Sins of omission are also very real, and Pope Francis invites us to incorporate uh, the environment, to incorporate our thought processes, to incorporate our relationship to the rest of creation as part of that indifference, as that, of that sin, that environmental sin that hovers over us. And in the process of judging 
the signs of the times, Pope Francis also points to what? Technology. Technology is something of a two-edged sword to use a violent image or a two-sided coin or pick two things that belong together of your own choosing. On the one hand, it is a great sign of the gift of co-creativity that God has uh, instilled in all of us, right? It's something that we share. It's, it's a reflection of our ingenuity and creativity and rationality and cooperation. But on the flip side, technology can also be treated as an end in itself. It can be treated in a capitalistic structure that seeks only profits, seeks only stock returns, and seeks whatever whoever has most to gain or maintain the status quo uh, can get away with. Pope Francis has pointed out, and he's not the only one, his predecessor, Benedict XVI, said the same thing in several of his uh, apostolic exhortations and in Deus Caritas Est, that technology is, in fact, uh, you know, a, 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 it's gotten us, in fact, I'm sorry, into some of the messes that we're in right now. Uh, a kind of blind faith, a fideistic relationship to technology has caused some of these problems. And we would be wise not to put all of our faith in technology to get us out of them. So I think that's an important thing to keep in mind. In judging the signs of our times, are we aware of our anthropocentrism, our own personal and collective indifference, and our reliance on technology, that if only we came up with a better filter, if only we came up with a better app, if only we came up with a better robot, or means of energy production, or whatever, then we could get out of this crisis. In the judging process, Pope Francis points then to the whole of the tradition uh, of Christianity. Again, kind of mirror, mirroring what he does in chapter 2, holding up the gospel of creation, he talks about the need for an integral ecology, a unifying vision, as it were, something that breaks beyond the right-before-us need to have uh, a solution to think about something that incorporates our faith, that incorporates uh, the the situation around us, uh, as well as uh, thinking about the generations that are to follow. Borrowing a phrase from John Paul II, he talks about intergenerational solidarity and justice, that the decisions that we make uh, should also take into consideration the generations yet to come. When he moves then into the action category, he presents us with two chapters. The first is very originally titled Action in chapter 5, where, as you might recall, he gives us a sort of a strong pragmatic call for political engagement, for social cooperation, for dialogue. Dialogue comes up a lot in that chapter. It was this chapter, by the way, in chapter 3, that a lot of, I guess the technical term is pundits, but talking heads on television got very upset about uh, two years ago when this encyclical first came out. Who is the Pope to talk about engaging politically? Who is a faith leader to talk about cooperating and dialoguing across different disciplines? He should just go to church and mind his own business. The sixth chapter follows from that. In order to act rightly, to engage in this action, one must uh, develop systems of education and spirituality that promote this integral ecology uh, that takes into consideration all these previous chapters. So that does absolutely no justice to the encyclical, but I hope that you see the pattern and we can hold on to that, okay? So I want to highlight now, uh, first, the challenge that Pope Francis presents to the church. What What is one of the takeaways I'm inviting us to think about tonight? The first is that the eco... Oh, look at that, it's cut off, okay. Well, it says up there in half, the ecological crises do not equal simply environmental concerns. One of the things that Pope Francis says very early on in Laudato Si is that this is not just uh, a text, a teaching about creation or about the environment. It's not just about environmental concerns. He says this is being placed within the social teaching of the Catholic faith. Here we might think of uh, the last hundred plus years, going back to Leo XIII and Rerum Novarum. We might think about all the great encyclicals and apostolic exhortations and teachings that have followed that have supported the, the rights of the oppressed, uh, the rights of workers, the dignity of all people, care for all life, and so forth. What Pope Francis does then is invite Christians to get out of this compartmentalized worldview that says that creation is one thing and our human way of being is another, 
and that concern for the environment, concern for non-human creation is the business of green peace and tree-hugging hippies. That's Pope Francis's language, not mine. I'm just kidding. He didn't say that. He borrows uh, a phrase that comes, I think, as best I can tell, first from Leonardo Boff in, in the early 1990s. Uh, in English, we get the translated work published by Orbis Press in 97, The Cry of the Earth, The Cry of the Poor, where the former Franciscan friar and uh, Brazilian theologian Leonardo Boff highlights that the plight of non-human creation is tied with that of the human family. Now, Professor Boff is not the first person to come up with this. He's not the first person to name this. This is something that has been at least uh, in the works for the last 50 years. Uh, the work of many, uh, particularly eco-feminist theologians, have highlighted precisely this concern. And I'll say more about that in a little bit. But the, the phrasing itself is striking uh, because Leonardo Boff, as many of you might know, has not been over the last 30 or 40 years in good favor with some of Pope Francis's predecessors. It's telling that this becomes one of the greatest challenges to arise from the Dato Sea. In other words, the cry of the earth, the cry of the poor are inseparable. As I mentioned earlier, early on, Pope Francis says that environmental concerns then are situated now within the tradition of Catholic social teaching. Pope Francis himself writes that this encyclical letter is now added to the body of that social teaching. This is not an option, as it were, for Catholic Christians. It's not a kind of hobby or a, a niche area of focus, but it's something that all of us are invited to be concerned about. Developing this notion of the relationship between the cries of the earth and the cries of the poor, Pope Francis says that today, however, we have to realize that a true ecological approach always becomes a social approach. It must integrate questions of justice in debates on the environment so as to hear the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. Well, let's take a look then at this challenge, this challenge of integration, that we can't think about uh, the plight of non-human creation and the human family independently. They have to be considered together. Concerning the cry of the earth, oh, look at that. We're cutting off St. Francis. Okay. It must be a Holy Cross thing. I see how it is. <laughs> this is one of the instances where I can't just blame the Jesuits. Right? Pope Francis says very early on that St. Francis of Assisi reminds us that our common home is like a sister with whom we share our life and a beautiful mother who opens her arms to embrace us. This sister now cries out to us because of the harm we have inflicted on her by our irresponsible use and abuse of the goods with which God has endowed her. Now here Pope Francis adopts this language to talk about creation that comes to us directly as he cites from Francis of Assisi, sister, brother, mother, this familial language. And I want to say a little bit more about this in, in just a few minutes, but let's hold on to this and to realize just for a second that though there are ways that we can rightly criticize this familial language and its application uh, to non-human creation, what Francis of Assisi meant, and it's oftentimes misunderstood, is something far more than a romantic or a naive or sort of a comical approach to the non-human order. Pope Francis recognizes in some sense an agency within creation. By using this familial language, we're recognizing that, well, wait a minute. In the same way that Job is forced to recognize by God's two discourses in that great book in, in the Hebrew Bible, that maybe everything in creation isn't just about the human person or the human family. Maybe actually God has some kind of proximity and relationship to the rest of creation. Maybe those of us in the 21st century aware of our 14 billion year old universe might say, what was God doing the rest of the time before we showed up? This creation, our sisters, our brothers, our mothers in creation have a kind of agency and relationship and have the ability to cry out to us because of the abuse we have inflicted. And it's stark language. I'll invite us to come back to that in the next section about where we go from here. But it's worth noting that Pope Francis is not uh, mincing words and talking about quite literal cries of non-human creation. He continues, su suggesting to us that we have come to see ourselves as her lords and masters, entitled to plunder her at will. 
the violence present in our hearts, wounded by sin, is also reflected in the symptoms of sickness evident in the soil, in the water, in the air, and in all forms of life. This is why the earth herself, burdened and laid waste, is among the most abandoned and maltreated of our poor. We have forgotten that we ourselves are dust of the earth, ha adama, from the dust of the earth, that our very bodies are made up of her elements, that we breathe her air and receive life and refreshment from her waters. From the outset, Pope Francis critiques uh, a way of thinking that's very commonplace in the Christian tradition. It's still very common in some circles today that we somehow have the right to, quote, dominate and subdue creation. And we interpret that as a kind of blank check to do as we please with non-human creation. But makes very clear, at least for Roman Catholics, and remember this is an encyclical letter, uh, it bears quite a bit of weight that we are not lords of the earth, but instead we are part of this creation. Now, I'll just give you a little bit of a spoiler alert. I don't think Pope Francis goes far enough. This is part of our challenge, and we'll see in the next section. But for our purposes here, we get a sense that he is, again, tying our experience with the experience of the rest of creation. He ties it, too, of course, to the cry of the poor, the human poor. He says that climate change is a global problem with grave implications, and we have seen this in our own backyard this week. Environmental, social, economic, political, and for the distribution of goods. These things, when we live in a comfortable place of security, a lack of precariousness, we forget things as simple as the distribution of goods. But if you're part of uh, the communities that live in the eastern part of Texas or the western coast of Louisiana, and your town is flooded and there's no way to get water and food and supplies to you, all of a sudden climate change and distribution of goods seems to make a lot of sense, doesn't it? He says that it represents one of the principal challenges facing humanity in our day, and this is the key element. Its worst impact will probably be felt by developing countries in coming decades. Now, what's striking to us, and let me just pause here, is that we are not a, quote, developing country. We're probably the most opposite you could be, on, on, at least in modern times, the United States, right, in terms of economic resources and military power. And yet we're experiencing this ourselves. May we empathize for a moment how other folks around the world are experiencing this to such greater degree. Pope Francis says that many of the poor live in areas particularly affected by phenomena related to warming, and their means of subsistence are largely dependent on natural reserves and ecosystemic services such as agriculture, fishing, and forestry. One of the things he talks about in, in, in highlighting the cry of the poor are these three elements that are oftentimes overlooked. I'm reminded of an early Franciscan text uh, in, in, from about the mid-13th century, after Francis's death, but not that long after Francis of Assisi's death, called the sacred exchange between Lady Poverty and Francis of Assisi. And in that exchange, uh, poverty, the evangelical council uh, or vow of poverty is personified as a noblewoman who's advising Francis of Assisi and the early brothers and sisters following him. And she says at one point that poverty is despised in all places except for those who live comfortably because they can afford not to know about it. We are oftentimes very uh, unaware. We are vincibly ignorant. We are committing sins, environmental and otherwise, of omission. And Pope Francis calls our attention to the ways in which the poor cry out as a result of the effects of global climate change and how they suffer disproportionately. Here are three examples. First, Pope Francis notes that the poor, the abject, the materially poor, are more likely to depend, to depend on animals and plant life that will, that will migrate or disappear with shifts in the climate or because of pollution. I don't know what the local chain is in South Bend. Kroger? Martins? Yeah, thank you, Bob. Yeah, when we go to Martins to get our food, uh, and we don't have to go and hunt the squirrels on the beautiful grounds of Notre Dame and Holy Cross and St. Mary's, then we're not aware necessarily of how our sisters and brothers, the non-human creatures around us, upon which we still rely for our substance, our subsistence rather, uh, will migrate as the environment changes and things become more intolerable. 
or because of pollution, but Pope Francis points out that the poor who have no choice but to hunt and gather, they do know. The second thing he reminds us of is that the poor have no financial resources to respond to these changes the way that the rich, and here I would include, and I dare include all of us gathered here, uh, the fact that we can afford just our time to spend an hour or so together at, at a university uh, to think about these things uh, is a sign of luxury and wealth, isn't it? I think about uh, an experience that I had. I was giving a retreat a couple years ago right in the midst of California, the Central Coast, and, and LA's uh, kind of the peak of, of their drought. Do you remember this a few years ago? This past year, the rain has returned, and so things have quieted down a little bit. Things have gotten slightly better. But I was giving a retreat at, um, uh, in Malibu, you know, as Franciscans are wont to do. You know. <laughs> and there was this retreat center there. The Franciscans on the California coast, the St. Barbara province Franciscans, have a beautiful retreat center that was, was gifted to them many, many, many years ago, and they continue to hold retreats. And it's up on this hill. If you've been there before, you know what I'm talking about. And you can see the coast. It's beautiful. And, and all around, you can see in the valley all of these mansions and, and huge properties. And, and they belong to all the rich and famous Hollywood people, the directors. Uh, I won't mention any names, but I'll make some up. James Cameron, uh, Britney Spears. These are fictional people. Uh, you know, Mel Gibson. All these imagined people are around there. And you can sit up there and look out and see these properties. Well, in the midst of the drought where there were fines levied against folks who were using more water than they were allowed according to the ration, um, there were plenty of people in these very wealthy properties that were very happy to pay $10,000 a month to use as much water as they wanted to keep their little spaces green in the midst of absolute burn, uh, brown burnout. I got thinking uh, after reading Laudato Si about that experience and the juxtaposition because that, those homes were not necessarily the only homes or even the primary homes of many of those wealthy people, but they were occasional homes or vac vacation homes or they had places elsewhere. But the people who staffed those houses, who watered those lawns with the drinking water that they were being asked to ration, those folks are the ones who take three or four buses and commute two or three hours to work minimum wage jobs watering these plants, watering these grounds, taking care of the pools. Thinking about this element, Pope Francis points us to, had the rains not come and the drought had gotten so bad that there was no drinking water left, no ability to farm anymore in California, it became another dust bowl. All those wealthy homeowners could get on their jets or even, God forbid, buy a commercial first class ticket and fly out of LAX to wherever. But what about the working poor? What about the variously documented folks? What about the day laborers in those neighborhoods? This is not something imagined on the other side of the world. This is something in our own backyard. The third point, Pope Francis also observes that there's no legal recourse for environmental refugees, a category that I, I dare uh, suggest many of us had never thought of or heard of until recent years, right? Though they've been around for a while. Women and children and men who flee lands because of climate change, pollution, or extinction. Think about the crises ongoing to this day, though we have our own crises at home and turmoil of all sorts that, that drains the attention of our news media, the refugee crises that exist in Syria and Iraq and Turkey continue to go on today. Those women and men have recognized international status as war and political refugees. But environmental refugees have no such status. What will happen to them when the waters dry up or the land becomes infertile or all the animals have left? The work is not finished, and given the amount of time I have to talk about this, I'm just going to talk about one point where we might move forward. But one of the challenges that Pope Francis leaves to the church, gives to the church, presents to us, as it were, as, as a command, is to discern a little bit more about our sins of omission and our ecological sinfulness and how, how we relate to one another in the human family is in no way distinct or removed from, in an absolute sense, from the way we relate to non-human creation. 
But Pope Francis doesn't give us all the answers. There's a lot more work we have to do. And so while Pope Francis highlights a number of challenges, including the reconnecting of the cry of the earth with the cry of the poor, among so many other things he names in Laudato Si in his ongoing ministry, he leaves a couple things out. Dun, dun, dun. This wasn't going to be all Pat, Pope Francis on the back, although he's doing a pretty good job. One real problem, Pope Francis names it, but I don't think he goes far enough, so this is Dan speaking now, is the problem of anthropocentrism I was talking about earlier. I think this is a much, much bigger problem than most of us are willing to admit. Anthropocentrism, as I said earlier, in kind of a joking way, makes us think that the whole universe, that all that God has created is about us, is for us. But it exists in all sorts of other ways, too. Let's, let's come up with a couple ways to approach this. Here's another brief history. Over the course of two, some 2,000 years, there have been three kind of general categories for thinking about how human beings relate to the rest of creation, to non-human creation. Right? The first has been called over time uh, the dominion model. The second is called the stewardship model, and that's probably most commonly uh, adopted and well-known today. And then there's a third called the kinship or community of creation model. Let me talk a little bit about each of these if you're not familiar with them. This dominion model comes from uh, a reading of uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 28. We have the, the line hrada, which is usually translated in English Bibles as have dominion, right? God gives human beings dominion, so we think, and are instructed or given a mandate uh, to subdue the rest of creation. In other words, this is read, this is understood in Genesis 1 as kind of a mandate or a gift of human sovereignty, a justification, uh, a license to kill non-human creation. In other words, this way of thinking about our relationship to the rest of creation is that God has made the whole cosmos for our use, wherein the exhortation to have dominion, we read in Genesis 1, means for us to dominate to take over the rest of creation, what I'm calling non-human creation. Um, there was an interesting book that was published uh, over the summer, and this may seem like a real uh, off-topic reference, uh, but I remember an interview with the author. Do you remember, have you ever heard of uh, this little phenomenon, this, this event that happened some years ago called the Donner Party? Yeah, people are like, where is he going with this? Well, the author of that, there was a book that just came out, and some of you may have read it or seen it or heard interviews with the author. Uh, that text is really fascinating because it goes into great detail, great historical detail about what happened in that very uh, eventful journey west, right, and, and the mistakes that were made and the tragedies that ensued. But one of the things that initiated that move was the idea of manifest destiny, so deeply rooted in uh, the context of the United States, right, this idea that um, what it means to be uh, a Christian, to be uh, a, a, a sovereign person, to be an American, quote-unquote, is to be able to dominate non-human creation. And one of the things the author points out in that book on the Donner Party is that those survivors of uh, the tragedies that unfolded were actually laughed and, and kind of scorned, were looked down upon. They weren't celebrated as survivors at first, in part because they were seen as not living out their biblical mandate to dominate creation. You let the environment take you over. You let the weather subdue and dominate you. Historians and scientists and theologians and philosophers have pointed out the problems with this. Uh, and there are many, and we could talk more about that in our, in our conversation if you'd like. The problem is that human beings uh, have, have seen ourselves as these lords and masters and kings and queens of creation, and Pope Francis has finally put an end to that from the Catholic perspective. He writes in Laudato Si in paragraph 64, indeed, we are not God. He says that the earth was given, uh, the earth was here, excuse me, before us and has been given to us. It allows us to respond to the charge that, uh, that Judeo-Christian thinking on the basis of this Genesis account of dominion has encouraged the unbridled exploitation of nature 
by painting humanity as domineering and destructive by nature. This is not a correct interpretation of the Bible as understood by the church, Pope Francis says. In other words, this idea of dominion, this understanding of our relationship to creation as one where we have a blank check to do with as we please, as sovereigns over the rest of this created universe, this has been put to an end. Thank God, it's off the table. Doesn't mean there aren't other Christians who think that's the case, but if you're Catholic Christians anyway as well, you've got some examination of conscience to do. You've got to form that conscience. So one of the things that arises in its place is the stewardship model. This vision of our relationship to creation that suggests that the planet, in fact, the whole cosmos, was not created for human use alone, right? It's not given to us to do with as we please in general, but rather is something that belongs to God, as Pope Francis calls it, our common home that has been entrusted to human beings for care and cultivation. We read in the Psalms that God owns this planet, we live here within it as an oikos, right, in Greek, as a household where we get ecology from. We have, as it were then, a divinely mandated duty or vocation to care for this oikos of God, this house of God. We are intermediaries then between the non-human creation, which is also of the earth, right, the ha'adama, and God, because we are both of the earth and created in the image of God. And for sure, this is a vast improvement over the dominion model, but it's not enough. Laudato Si, I think, falls very clearly in this category. When we talk about intergenerational solidarity and justice, this is within the human family. We're called to be good stewards, good caretakers of our common home. Yes, it doesn't belong to us. No, it's true. We're no longer lords of creation, Pope Francis is basically saying. He's saying, good news. Now you're landlords of creation. It's your job to be the house managers. But there's been a third model, a third paradigm, a third lens through which we can view our relationship to creation. And this is where I want to just focus a little bit of time before we kind of wrap up. The kinship model. There's always been a small minority tradition that embraced a third option, this kinship model or community of creation approach. And this is where the guy who made my very fashionable outfit famous comes in. Francis of Assisi. Certainly not the first to hold this view. It's clear in sacred scripture. It's in the book of Job. It's in the Psalms. It's in uh, Romans. It's in uh, Genesis, if we read it carefully. We see it throughout uh, sacred revelation and sacred scripture. But in our own time, several centuries later, Theologians and philosophers and other scholars, I think, have finally caught up with the Franciscan tradition and with the tradition of sacred scripture and with others. I have to shout out to the Franciscans. <laughs> it's not always like that there. And what do I mean by this? The kinship model of creation takes very seriously what we read in the second Genesis account, that we are created ha'adamah, we are earthlings, Adam Newsflash is not a proper noun. Sorry for all the dudes named Adam here. <laughs> Genesis 2, at least, is not about you. We can argue about Genesis 3. Adam, Adam, is an earthling, an earth creature, right? I point to a previous uh, Metaleva lecture given here with Professor Elizabeth Johnson, in which she points out and says so well in summary, I don't think there's been a better articulation of this, that if separation is not the ideal in our understanding of Christianity and God's creation, but connection is, if dualism is not the ideal, but the relational embrace of diversity is, if hierarchy is not the ideal, but mutuality is, then the kinship model more closely approximates reality. What Professor Johnson points out is the same thing that uh, scientists will affirm, right? Now, Genesis 2 gets it so right, unknowingly. You know, we are made up of dust. I think it's Carl Sagan who gets the credit for that expression, right? We're made of star stuff. But it's so true. We're made up of hydrogen and oxygen and nitrogen and carbon and whatever else. I don't know. I'm not a scientist. I'll leave it to the biologists. But you know what I mean. It's something that any eighth grader in a biology class could tell you. 
Laudato Si, I think, is, is a liminal text. It only goes so far. It stops somewhere between stewardship and this notion of kinship. Pope Francis adopts the language of St. Francis of Assisi. He throws around words like Mother Earth and Sister Creation and Brother Creation and so forth. But I, with all due respect to the Holy Father, who in many ways is living up to his namesake, doesn't go all the way. And the reason I, I suggest that is because what Francis of Assisi means in that great canticle of the creatures that Pope Francis cites in total in Laudato Si, the one that most of us know from our hymnody, right? There's usually the two flavors of the canticle of the creatures. There's the old German anthem, all creatures of our God and King, two, three, four, right? It's very, you know, very marching. Or there's the more contemporary Marty Hagen, a canticle of the sun, right? The heavens are telling the glory of God. And we can dance to it. It's a, it's a lot more flowing. Interestingly enough, neither of those songs include any familial language. Praise for the sun, the giver of day, not brother sun, not mother earth. All creatures, okay. But where do we fit into it? That great canticle of the creatures, St. Francis of Assisi, he makes a theological statement that articulates what Professor Johnson and others have talked about, what scientists have affirmed in our own modern era, that the brother and the sister and the mother language is not cute, it's not romantic, it's not naive. As I am fond of saying, if you think that's the case, then you too have succumbed to the negative effects of the birdbath industrial complex, <laughs> which tries to romanticize and caricature St. Francis of Assisi and has for many, many years. But Fran or St. Francis of Assisi understood what it is that Job was being told in those divine discourses, understood what's being revealed in the Psalms and what natural sciences reveal to us today, that the brother and the sister of the rest of creation is quite literal. And we know this now, right? Our genetic scientists can affirm this in so many ways. And I could say more about this, but we have limited time. So let me ask this question. So where do we go from here? I think there's a challenge that Pope Francis leaves us with. It's a mini vacuum. He's done a great job calling attention to the way in which we need to not just focus on the cry of humanity, though that's important, but it's always in, in already tied to the cry of the earth and vice versa. But the challenge, I think, is for us to go beyond stewardship. Somebody once asked me, why do you think Pope Francis didn't embrace in Laudato Si a more overt kinship or community of creation model and say things like, we are brothers and sisters with squirrels and trees and rocks and caterpillars? Because 50% of you probably had this reaction right now, like, ooh, that's weird. And for, the, uh, for there to be a magisterial teaching on the sin of environmental crises and our role in that, uh, to jump all the way to kinship might have been just too much of a shock. That's my reading. I don't know. Contrary to popular belief, Pope Francis and I don't text each other each night. <laughs> like so much of our, our Christian tradition, like the creedal tradition, for instance, I think one way we need to approach Laudato Si is as a starting point, not an end point. You know, the, the late theologian Karl Rahner famously asked this question about Chalcedon, right, as we understand Christology, about uh, Jesus Christ being fully divine and fully human. Is that the ending point of the doctrine? Is that it, nothing more to be said, or is it a starting point? I think Laudato Si is a starting point. So where are we heading? Where do we go? I think that we can learn, and I'm not alone in this, from the intra-human dynamics of colonization. The way that we treat one another, right? Again, taking Pope Francis's lead and connecting the cry of the poor with the cry of the earth, creation uh, of a non-human sort with human creation, in order then to respond to the ecological signs of our times regarding our extra-human family of creation. One of the resources I think that's so great is, is the late eco-feminist philosopher Val Plumwood. If you haven't read her work, I highly, highly recommend it. An Australian scholar who died far too young, in one of her texts she argued that in the latter half of the 20th century, really in our own time, it became commonplace to recognize the detrimental experience and effects of Eurocentric and North American colonization in terms of the human and socioeconomic costs, sometimes including the pillaging of natural resources, right? We could think of 
even in the most recent time in the last 20 years, the role of fossil fuel extraction and the devastating effects that's had on global economy and violence around the world. We can think of so many other examples, and she's right, where we understand that the environment, non-human creation, what is oftentimes called nature, is related to colonization and its ill effects. But then she goes on to say what we're less accustomed to acknowledging, though, is the idea that the concept of colonization can be applied directly to non-human nature itself. And that the relationship between humans or certain groups of them and the more than human world might be aptly characterized as one of colonization. What do we mean by this? We tend to view humanity as beyond or outside of, quote, nature. When's the last time you went out in nature? It's a trick question, because you are nature. Unless you're having an out-of-body experience, and then we, for another time. We tend to structure our ethics anthropocentrically, rele relegating rather non-human creation to a place of instrumentality. That's I'm sad to say, I'm sad to report my disappointment with language like intergenerational solidarity. Intergenerational in the human family alone treats the rest of creation instrumentally. It's something we need to preserve so we don't waste it all on ourselves. We can save some for our other humans, you know, ancestors, or not ancestors, but descendants. We tend, therefore, to other, right, to be the arbiters of alterity, to decide who is and who isn't worthy of valuation, and we other non-human creation, which arises from and reinforces hierarchical categories of human beings, these kind of categories that we have long used to distance ourselves from the rest of creation. And this is where the wisdom of ecofeminist theologians comes in especially clearly and so importantly. You know, this idea that what makes human beings different from non-human creatures well, one of the ways that Aristotle talked about it, right, that we all learned about in Philosophy 101 is what? Human beings are, quote, rational animals. That sounds familiar, doesn't it, to, to an educated group? Well, who's rational and who's, quote, irrational? You see then all of a sudden the demarcation, the separation where patriarchy, sexism, and misogyny is tied to the way that human beings as a species also relate to the rest of creation. Who gets associated with what? We tend through this process to radically distance ourselves from other creatures. That's the first thing. And the second thing we do is we reduce non-human creatures to a place of homogenization, devoid of individuality, devoid of uniqueness, and devoid of moral agency. One of the things I teach in Chicago is fundamental theology. And uh, I, I talk a lot about uh, the phenomenological tradition in the 20th century uh, Roman Catholic theological tradition, mostly Karl Rahner. Some of you are very familiar with the work of Rahner. And I always use the example of squirrels and how human beings are not squirrels and vice versa. That according to Rahner, squirrels are basically objects, right? They're not persons and subjects like we are. But I wonder if that's not right. <laughs> I wonder if there's something wrong about that, and I can say more about that in the Q&A, if you're interested in talking more about squirrel agency. <laughs> Maybe a better way to put it is in terms of ethics. If we take Laudato Si's invitation to move beyond it seriously, to go from here, well, can we talk about how we relate to and understand the value of non-human creation beyond instrumentalization? Does it have intrinsic value? Pope Francis gestures at points in the Dato C to that reality. He says that other aspects of creation have value regardless of our relationship to it. But how do we structure our own teaching? How do we structure our own moral compasses? Val Plumwood goes on, she says, excuse me, <coughs> that an anthropocentric culture rarely sees nature and animals as individual centers of striving or needs, doing their best in their conditions of life. Now, i got to stop here because I hear myself too. And I realize I'm wearing this 800-year-old, still yet very fashionable outfit. <laughs> I cannot emphasize how cool this is. And I realize the birdbath industrial complex has so warped our minds to realize that this sounds fantastical. What do you mean, squirrels in blades of grass 
having value, striving or needs, doing their best in their conditions for life. But I invite us to suspend that for a moment, to bracket that judgment, to go back to traditions that are not so colonized by Eurocentric and Western ways of philosophical thinking. Think of our sisters and brothers who are Native Americans here in North America or First Nations people. Think of as Val Plumwood has done a lot of work uh, you know, in her own time of the Aboriginal folks in, uh, in Australia and New Zealand. There's a, an appreciation for the agency of non-human creation and our relationship to it. Christians would do well to take note. She continues, instead, nature is conceived in terms of interchangeable and replaceable units as resources, hint, hint, intergenerational solidarity. Rather than as infinitely diverse and always in excess of knowledge or classification, anthropocentric culture conceives nature and animals as all alike in their lack of consciousness, which is assumed to be exclusive to the human. What makes us so unique, it's not just rationality, but we have personality. I'm an individual. You've met one squirrel, you've met all the squirrels. They're not like friars. You meet one friar, you meet one friar. Right? Once nature and animals are viewed as machines or autonomous, minds are closed to the range and diversity of their mind-like qualities. I think of the great work of ethnographers, peop- or ethographers, I'm sorry, people like uh, Francis Duvall, uh, and, and many others who have done work in, with, in, in primatology and the study of other creatures to other uh, of our sisters and brothers in the family of creation uh, that anytime we come up with sort of a, a litmus test, whether it's rationality or religion or moral agency or cooperation or language or, or, or structural habitat construction or anything we can come up with, our non-human sisters and brothers, the other creatures in this world, say, we do that too. The question is, are we so anthropocentric in our culture, in our epistemology, our way of seeing the world, that we think that if you don't speak English or French or, or Czech, you don't speak a human language, then you're not worthwhile. It's a form of that reiteration. It's another form of colonization. Going back to uh, Professor Johnson, the kinship attitude, this is our challenge, right? Does not measure these differences on a scale of higher or lower ontological dignity, but appreciates them as integral elements in the robust thriving of the whole. The family of creation. Kinship then is this family, this community of creation. And to start thinking this way, which is my invitation to us tonight, Laudato sees the starting point, but where I'd like to see us go and invite us to consider is can we shift our imaginations? Can we shift our theology, our ethics, our praxis, even our own ways of thinking and praying? When you pray grace next time before a meal, let us learn something from our sisters and brothers of other ancient religious traditions that have existed long before Christianity and maybe thank not only God for the gifts we have received, but for the life that has been offered that we might live. Three last comments. This refashioning of our image of creation, which I think is the challenge Pope Francis leaves to us, does a couple of things. One, in such an image, no longer are environmental tragedies like we're experiencing as signs of our times today simply the consequence of human domination over creation, but instead they become cases of ecological domestic violence. If that sounds outrageous and the birdbath industrial complex is ringing in your ears, let me break some news to you. Every breath we take in this auditorium, every little uh, watt of light that we benefit from, comes to us from the lives of previously living creatures or currently living creatures like trees and algae that take our useless poison carbon dioxide and photosynthesize to provide us with some oxygen to breathe. Thank you, trees. The meals that we had today so that we might continue to live came from previously living creatures, right? Maybe not sentient creatures, maybe not animals as we categorize them, but plants that were once living. 
unless you're eating just berries and fruits, and then you're just eating the seeds. That's another story. Somebody brought that up to my attention once, and so I have to qualify that. I have thought of that now. But the thing is, the rest of creation, our sisters and brothers that, that St. Francis talks about and that Pope Francis gestures to, are already doing their part in this family of creation. They're already caring for us. They're good family members. We're the members of the family. We're like the prodigal daughters and sons who walk away. Right? Refashioning our image of creation in this way, in such an image, no longer can we step back and watch the destruction of the earth from afar. But instead, we must recognize that all life is interconnected. I just gave some examples of how we see that day to day. And the death of a species or the destruction of a forest is also somehow a transgression that implicates all of us and from which we all suffer. Can we retune, recalibrate our way of thinking to align ourselves to that reality of a broader family? refashioning our image of creation this way, in such an image no longer is the earth then simply our rental property. No longer are we neither the lords nor the landlords of creation to be treated as if we were its stewards, hired hands, as it were, but instead sisters and brothers. We must come to see then this creation for what it really is, the dwelling place of the divine in and through and among us. So I know I went a little bit over my time, but I thank you for your attention and I hope we have some time for conversation. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you. We have time for about um, five to 10 minutes of questions. So um, Michelle and I will circulate the microphone. Thank you again, Father Ran. Isn't one of the roots, causes of our, all of our ecological problems, uh, the world system of economy that is our penchant for consumerism, mm -hmm. so that uh, it would seem that instead of the uh, band-aid or the patch approach that we are taking, that we need a fundamental change? Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I thank you for that. That's, and again, because of time, I, I wasn't able to include some of this, but that's, that's precisely something that, that is uh, a concern of Pope Francis's. And in his talking about connecting that cry of the poor with the, the cry of the earth, he highlights uh, those economic challenges and this idea of, uh, of unbridled capitalism, the so-called free market, uh, which, which is something that perpetuates uh, these structures of injustice that harm the environment, that harm the human family, especially the most vulnerable and poor within it. Um, so you're exactly right. Uh, and, and any kind of response, that's one of the reasons why I think people are very quick to embrace stewardship, because it seems like a goal-oriented, praxis-oriented, and maybe sometimes even quick fix. What we need to do is recycle more. What we need to do is eat less meat. What we need to do is one thing or two things or three things, and we're done. And that in itself, that way of thinking, isn't holistic enough to respond to the deeply rooted crises that we're talking about. So I think that's itself a symptom and effect of, of a capitalistic you know, econ economy that's gone out of control. And if I may ask also, uh, I believe St. Paul, <coughs> Paul says that uh, creation is in need of redemption. Yeah. Well, well, what does he mean by that? Oh, that's such a good question. I got that a few years ago, and somebody said, I have uh, uh, a little puppy that I love very much. Does my puppy sin? I don't know, because last I, I still can't speak puppy. Uh, though I, I serve as a minister of the sacrament of penance in the human family, I can't hear puppy confessions just yet. In all seriousness, um, I don't have a good answer to that. You know, there are debates around, and what you're, I believe you're referring to is Romans 8. You're talking about that passage where, where all of creation is groaning for that day of redemption uh, in, in a release from this captivity caused by sin. And, and over the centuries, some scripture scholars and interpreters have said, well, that's because our human sin, the sin of Adam and Eve, as it were, 
so drastically affect, and this was Augustine's uh, interpretation in part, it has affected all of creation. That's how it's spread like, like an illness. Um, others have said, in, in including contemporary scripture scholars, no, actually, if we look, particularly the way he uses the Greek ta panta, all of creation, all of creation, this kind of echoing, that no, maybe there is a, a kind of agency that's implied there. It's ambiguous, and I'm not a New Testament scholar, so I'm going to stop there, like my listing of uh, elements in the human body. I'm not a scientist, so I have to know my limits. But um, I'm not willing to say that, uh, that, that non-human creatures don't experience uh, what we in the Christian community refer to as sin. I think if we take seriously what ethologists, those who study quote-unquote animal behavior, reveal to us, and they come from a scientific and a so-called secular context, they suggest at times that there is something we humans might call moral agency exercised in different non-human creatures, and if there's moral agency, then maybe there's a decision to do wrong. That's for their creator to decide, <laughs> you know, like us. I was wondering about like the idea that we need to change the, the way that we view the earth and that we need to exist as a part of it and with existence with it and tangent with it. But I was also like, how do we do that holistically as a whole community when we exist in a world of like such te technological advances yeah. where we, we can't exactly go back to where indigenous people were working, where we live exactly on the land because we've grown accustomed to the ease of technology, but also like how do we reconcile the fact that we need to make this change yeah. and how do we do that essentially? Oh, thanks for the easy questions right off the bat. <laughs> um, I, do, I mean, it's, it's, it's the worst kind of answer in a setting like this and I'm sad to be the, the, the bearer of such an answer, but I really don't know. I struggle with this myself. Um, and that's why I was very deliberate in my, my phrasing as an invitation, because I'm included in this audience. We need to discern together. I think, um, I think that's something we have to work out together. And it begins with things that seem little or insignificant. For instance, just the way we talk about creation. Do we pause when we say something like, I'm going to spend time in nature? What does that mean? Do we ever think about our place to it? I, that's why I like the, the example of prayer before meals. You know, lots of religious uh, practitioners of various faith communities, Christian, Jewish, other practitioners of other faith, belief, uh, faith systems, you know, offer prayer before they dine together, people dine together in community. What if we started incorporating language that acknowledges the life that is sustaining us? What, that's what we're doing, you know? It's no different than watching the Discovery Channel. I mean, I guess now they just do reality TV, but before when they used to show tigers eating, you know, antelope and stuff, um, I mean, that's what we're doing. We're just doing it with forks and knives and sitting in chairs, right? So I think a starting point, and this is a practice I'm trying to cultivate, is to, is to change the way I think, the way I speak, and the way I write about other creatures that are not part of the immediate human family. That's why I use that language of intra-human questions and extra-human questions. Some people ask, um, and maybe I'm anticipating a question, well, do you mean to tell me that all creatures, we should, we should be like Janus, we should be Janes, all the flattening of value, that human life is the same as a blade of grass or you know, a squirrel or something? No, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that we, as, as, at least from the Christian tradition, really need to take seriously discernment in all aspects of our life. And if we take seriously the relationship of the human family to the non-human family in this broader community of creation, um, then we can do those little things and hopefully it'll build to other things. I don't think we turn back. I mean, I'm kind of grateful that this MacBook is allowing me to project this thing up here so that you can all see it, you know, and, and with ready ease. And I'm so grateful for these lights too, you know, in the building. I'm not advocating for some kind of false nostalgia for a past, but that is a real struggle. How do we balance that today? Um, so thank you, and I'm sorry it's not a more satisfying answer. It's a great, great question. Uh, one more question back there. In the last slide, you had the, the presence of the divine in and through and among us. Um, could you say a little bit about how the kinship model could 
be enriched by an awareness of the presence of the divine in creation, this idea of the, the cosmic Christ or Elizabeth Johnson's idea of the spirit's action in creation. Well, well Bobby, beat me to it because I was going to okay. punt to Beth Johnson <laughs> in that regard and to Professor Johnson's, you know, she, she uh, you know, has a great essay uh, that was published independently and then uh, I think was recently published in a collection of essays where she takes John Muir's you know, the great kind of uh, American explorer and, and uh, environmentalists question and, and plays with it theologically and asks, you know, is God's grace large enough for bears? Um, so I think, I think she's right. I think she's right about a lot of things. I think she's especially right if what I'm understanding is in, in so much of her work too, the, the slippage of the Holy Spirit out of our out of our frame, and that if we suffer from a, a robust pneumatology, to talk about the presence of the divine in and through and among us is, it sounds radical, it sounds almost pantheistic to some people, but this is really, you know, reflected in, in the Hebrew Bible in the symbols of divine imminence. We see it in Genesis 1 verse 2, for instance, you know, uh, in the tohu wabohu, it's the ruach Halloween that draws near and brings order. Uh, we see it in, in so many places. So, I mean, I'm a Franciscan, so I can do a shout out to St. Bonaventure as well, who sometimes, depending on how you interpret it, what camp you're in, think this is good or bad, that he's viewed sometimes in his creation as a panentheist, this idea of God's radical presence to all of creation. I don't know what's so controversial about that. My response in this long-winded weaving way to your very good question, Bob, is this idea that it doesn't make sense. We can't understand how God relates to squirrels and to trees if we don't restore the, the place of the Spirit in creation. And that how God relates to a squirrel, for instance, is not something I anticipate us figuring out any more than squirrels are going to figure out how we are relating to God. That's why I like, going back to this earlier question too, the language of intra and extra human family. Our purpose in theology, and I think people like Karl Rahner and others uh, and, and the philosophers he draws from and, and thinking about what it means to be a human person and that phenomenology, there are, there's a lot of good stuff there and it's very, at least according to my experience, true from the human vantage point. But to claim from that lens, as Heidegger does for instance, that a squirrel is lacking something in being, for instance, or from a theological perspective, lacking a proximity to God that the rest of creation, as our Eastern Christian brothers and sisters would say, needs the human family to serve as priests or intermediaries between non-human creation and God, I don't buy that. And so I think going back to this, the answer you actually gave it in your question is, is the role of the Spirit and how God moves through creation um, is and remains as mysterious in some ways, pneumatologically, as is revealed and described in Genesis 1, as far as I can tell. Um, but there's, I think there's so much work to do. Students that, are, that managed to continue to stay and didn't skip out after the lecture, awesome. Um, lots of work ahead, please do it. Um, I'll be with you on that too, so thank you. I don't know if that's, again, satisfying, but it's a great question. Thank you. Thank you again to Father Horan, and he has one closing announcement. I have one commercial break. I joked about Verizon, but I have a non-joke this time. Um, and I asked Arlene if I could just talk about this because this lecture series is called The Francis Effect, which is great. And you have two more uh, ex extraordinary speakers that are coming down the road. Tomorrow morning, uh, I'm part of a project that's being launched also called The Francis Effect. And it's, uh, it's a twice-monthly podcast that's coming out. Um, it, it, oh, that's not it. There we go. And so as of tomorrow morning, uh, it'll be on iTunes and Google Play and all those Stitcher and all the things that people use if you listen to podcasts. Um, and it's a conversation between a radio producer who approached me about starting this program in Chicago who has a PhD in theology from Vanderbilt and myself. And occasionally, we bring in different guests as well. Um, and so the three themes on the first episode coming tomorrow morning, uh, the first one is uh, uh, Catholic social teaching, racism, and the Confederate monuments. The second one is Hurricane Harvey and global climate change, carrying this conversation forward, maybe. 
And the third is, as my co-host uh, titled the, the section, what's up with Paul Ryan? <laughs> so, so I'll leave it to you for that. Thank you for indulging that one commercial break. It's free. It's totally free. So please subscribe. Thank you. Please join me in thanking him one more time.